Okay. Yeah? No feedback? Okay. Great. Okay, so I'm going to start today by finishing where we were this morning. That is to say, somehow the end. Oh, that's really. Let me get a new one. The end of the story of how this stuff looks over FP. So we were analyzing FP algebras this morning, and I was telling you at the very end of the talk that we were going to have some relation to crystalline cohomology, which mimicked the sort of relationship that we saw in the second talk between classical periodic cyclic homology and Dram cohomology. And so the precise theorem, which was some joint work with Bhagav Bhatt and Peter Schultzer, so we take some R smooth over FP, then it's topological periodic cyclic homology. So informally, I'd like to say it's built from, let me make a slightly better statement, uh, it has a filtration whose graded pieces are just given, it's a two-periodic filtration whose graded pieces are given by all the shifts of the crystalline cohomology of this smooth, excuse me, that should be a ZP, given by all shifts of the crystalline cohomology of this FP algebra. So I remind you the formula that I wrote on this morning that this crystalline cohomology means the Duram cohomology of R tilde over ZP, where R tilde is any smooth uh, lift of R as a ZP algebra. So it's any smooth ZP algebra lifting R. And the theory of crystalline cohomology tells you that this object does uniquely exist and is independent of the lift. So I'd like, just like to give you some, some idea uh, modeled on the talk on Sunday. Maybe I said Tuesday a moment ago, but my whole days of the week are shifted at the moment. It's a bit confusing starting on Saturday. Um, of how one can produce some relationship between topological periodic cyclic homology and crystalline cohomology. So we argue, as we did on Sunday, that we can completely describe the behavior of our cohomology theory TP on R in terms of its perfection and all these tensor powers that appear in this check resolution. where well, I'm going to totalize this. So this is just as on Sunday, if I've got my days of the week right. We saw that all our theories like Hochschild homology and periodic cyclic homology and all the variants, and these hold for the topological theories too, satisfy a property of flat descent that lets me describe their values on smooth things in terms of their behavior on these sorts of objects, which are our quasi-regular semi-perfect rings. And so, to understand what's happening in the smooth case, everything reduces to some analysis of what's happening on these quasi-regular semi-perfect rings, and in particular, just to understanding their TP0. That will give us the sort of course information that we need to prove the theorem. Where here A is quasi-regular semi Perfect. I remind you that this means that I can write A as B mod I, where B is itself perfect. That is to say, every element in it has a unique pth root, and I is some nice ideal, for example, generated by a regular sequence, tends to suffice. So what sort of, this is, 
some ring that we have some coarse information about. So if we think about the spectral sequence describing it, and I draw a spectral sequence this morning describing TP of FP, there'll be something similar in this case, which will be built up out of all the topological Hochschild homology groups of A. And we'll be able to read off that, that this is some P torsion free, ah, uh, maybe P torsion freeness can't easily be read off. Okay, I, uh, well, that'll turn out to be true, so it's, it's, not, it's not wrong what I'm writing. Uh, it'll be a P torsion free, it'll be complete filtered ring. So say this filtration is coming from the spectral sequence and the associated graded is going to be described by these terms on the spectral sequence, which will be copies of topological Hochschild homology. And these will only be sitting in even degree. And as we saw this morning, for any FP algebra, we get some information about the topological Hochschild homology groups just in terms of the Hochschild homology groups. Did we have this long exact sequence that showed the THH groups being built up out of multiple copies of shifted Hochschild homology groups. But we saw on Sunday that we could compute the Hochschild homology groups of a quasi-regular semi-perfect ring in terms of this divided power algebra associated to A mod I squared. We also have some information, some other information from this morning because we saw that in some reasonable degree of generality, TP was always a lifting of HP from characteristic P to mixed characteristic. And what that will tell us in this case is that whatever this ring TP zero of A is, when we look at it mod P, we just get HP zero of A over FP, which on Sunday, we saw was a divided power envelope. To be precise, it was the divided power envelope of B subjecting onto A. In, otherwise, this, in other words, this ring is obtained by formally adding to B everything that looks like F to the N over N factorial as F varies over the ideal. So it doesn't matter if you don't understand if you don't somehow follow how everything's fitting together here, what's important is that we can just read off some coarse information that whatever TPA of zero is, this filtered ring, it's built out of an awful lot of divided powers coming from Hochschild homology, and mod P, we even know that it already looks like some divided power envelope. In fact, we know one more thing about it. We also know that it's a W of B algebra. So how do we know that? So TP0 of A will receive a map from TP0 of B by functoriality. And since B is a perfect ring, it behaves like FP, and its TP0 will just give us its ring of width vectors in the same way as TP0 of FP gave us ZP this morning. And so the goal, we've got to try to identify this. We need some W of B algebra which has lots and lots of divided powers related to the ideal I, which is defining A. And somehow there's only one possibility. It's what's called, there's a little completion, it's what's called the crystalline period ring associated to A. So this is a classical object which appears in the theory of periodic cohomology and is related to crystalline cohomology. And defined as follows, I take the divided power envelope. So I've got this ring of width vectors of my perfect ring B by going mod P this surjects back onto B, like usual for rings of width vectors, and then that surjects onto A. So I add to the ring of width vectors everything that looks like F to the N over N factorial, 
as f varies over elements which die under this process. And this is a classical construction that one finds in the theory of periodic cohomology, as I say, in particular in the theory of crystalline cohomology. And the key is to identify TP0 of A as a filtered ring with this object. And that's not so easy to do. And I just want to write down one input that goes into checking this identification of rings By some formal arguments, one reduces this to the simplest quasi-regular semi-perfect ring, namely that of fpt to the plus or minus 1 over p infinity modulo t minus 1. So recall that I've got to take some perfect ring, and I've got to mod it out by some non-zero divisor. And somehow the simplest such perfect ring you can write down, which is not just fp, is something like fpt to the plus or minus 1 over p infinity, and I mod it out by t minus 1. And this case is more of a sufficient to control what's happening in general. See, if you understand this sort of ring and you believe that everything behaves nicely with respect to tensor products, then you can also understand how all these theories behave in the case in which I write down a multivariable analog of such a ring, just by tensoring together 100 or 200 or however many you need of them. And in the case of some general A, so a general quasi-regular semi-perfect ring, every element contains infinitely many p roots. So by picking some choices of p roots, I can find lots of surjections from rings that look like this down onto my original ring. And this gives me enough structure to control what's happening for the case of a general A if one can analyze this sort of case. And the advantage of this sort of case, I think I'll just write a mysterious formula, and we can finish there. just to sort of tantalize a little bit. So this ring here, in which I join all p power roots of t, and then I mod out by t minus 1, you can view this as the, the group algebra for the group qp mod zp. It's fp group algebra qp mod zp. But group algebras also make sense over the sphere spectrum. So I can look at the group algebra over the sphere spectrum for the group qp mod zp, and recover my original ring A by tensoring it back up to FP. And this descends the problem somehow to behavior where one is really over the base of the sphere spectrum, and you can analyze better what's going on. That lets you establish, that's a key input anyway in establishing this type of result. And then as I, as I say, you sort of argue in some formal way to get it for an arbitrary A, and then you return to the general program that you understand the topological periodic cyclic homologies of all of the terms appearing in here, and by assembling that together, you get information in terms of TP of the smooth thing, in terms of crystalline period rings, which, as their name suggests, are related to crystalline cohomology. I don't even think it deserves to put a QED box. I just wanted to give some vague idea there of how these quasi-regular semi-perfect rings enter the game, even in this case, and how the key is once again to do some local calculation, some local genuinely algebraic calculation of the TP0 of these sorts of rings. So let me move now onto the story in mixed characteristic, and hopefully at the end we'll arrive at some similar such statement where the goal will be to calculate some TP0 of quasi-regular semi-perfectoids in terms of some prismatic period rings. And then we'll really have reached the state of the art, and we can call it a day. So we're going to examine the topological Hochschild homology, the topological periodic cyclic homology, and so on, of ZP algebras. So the key starting point this morning, without which we would really have been unable to do anything, was this calculation of Birchstead that the topological Hochschild homology groups of FP were remarkably simple. They vanished in odd degree 
They were all one-dimensional in even degree, and multiplication was as nice as possible, that is to say, given by a polynomial algebra structure. I mean, from that, we formally got some course information about THH of any FP algebra. From that, we were then able to analyze the spectral sequence for topological periodic cyclic homology of FP, from which we then got course information about TP of any FP algebra. We showed that it was a lifting of HP. But this was really the starting point. We couldn't get off the ground without this hard result coming from topology of Buchstead. So if we want to develop some, sing some similar theory where we replace FP by something else, then we've got to ask, I mean, if we want to mimic the same arguments, given a ring A, well, more precisely, for what rings A can we hope to have a similar description of its topological Hochschild homology groups? They should be isomorphisms. So we've seen that it's true in the case of FP. That's the theorem of Buchstead. More generally, it's true, as I've mentioned a couple of times, if A is any perfect FP algebra, that can be deduced in some formal way from Buchstead's theorem. And it turns out that it's also true if A is any perfectoid ring. And maybe, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if there's other cases actually, uh, or if it's, I don't know. So let me define for you these perfectoid rings, maybe not in the fullest possible generality, but somehow in the orthogonal case of what we've studied up until now. So these perfectoid rings, which have I mean, become really uh, crucially important in periodic arithmetic geometry since Schulte introduced them six, seven years ago. These are some like mixed characteristic analogs of perfect FP algebras. And so they enjoy many analogous properties, particularly from a homological point of view, uh, but remarkably, even their topological Hochschild homology is going to, is going to behave in a, in a similar fashion. So here's their definition. I, I won't give it to you in the fullest possible degree of generality, but one which is, well, wide enough to cover what we're interested in. So a ring A is perfectoid if, so I ask firstly, that it's periodically complete. And to simplify my life, as I say, I want to study the sort of orthogonal case to that of perfect FP algebras. So let me make it P torsion free. There are some things that live in between the P-torsion free case and the FP case, but we don't really need to look at those today. Secondly, I ask, that the Frobenius is surjective mod P, that is to say, given any element in the ring, I can extract a pth root of it modulo p. So I have lots of pth roots mod p. I also want to have lots of pth roots in the ring itself. So the way to ensure that is that I, can, is that I impose the extra condition that I can extract some pth root of p at least up to worrying about units. So let me say there exists a unit in the ring such that P times U has a pth root. So if I start with some general A, I can extract a pth root of it mod P, so it's 
I've got some pth root plus an error term, which looks like p times a. I can also extract a pth root of the p that's appearing here up to rescaling it by a unit. Then I'll again be able to extract some pth root of this error term, mod p, and so on and so forth. This process lets me extract lots and lots of pth roots. And just to control that a little bit, one adds the following condition that a, basically I don't want to have extra pth roots that contain denominators with p's. So I ask that a be p closed in a 1 over p. That is to say, if I have an element, so if I take an element of a and I find some p root of it which lies in here, then in fact that p root was already in here. It's an integral closeness condition. And indeed, if a were integrally closed inside a 1 over p, then I would get this. But I just need to somehow ask this as far as, I need to ask for integral closeness as far as p roots are concerned. So for example, but the, the typical example, the original example, and the one which I'll focus on today for the sake of concreteness, for the sake of concreteness, is that, so we look at CP. So this is defined to be, I take the periodic numbers, I pass to some algebraic closure, the problem with this is it's no longer periodically complete. So one periodically completes it. And it's well known that then the result of this process is still algebraically closed. So this is some periodically complete, algebraically closed extension of QP. And it's over that, well, it plays the role of the, the complex numbers when you're doing periodic geometry. And it's over that that we'll tend to study things. That will tend to be our, our base field of interest. And inside that, I can look at O which is its ring of integers. So that's some, some big valuation ring, the elements inside here of periodic valuation at most one. Or if you like, it's the periodic completion of the integral closure of ZP inside here. And this then is perfectoid. Well, let's quickly run over. It's somehow periodically complete by definition, it's p torsion free because it's sitting inside a field. Anything admits a p root mod p, well, in fact, anything already admits a p root. It's the ring of integers of some algebraically closed field. So I can, in fact, extract p roots in here. That covers for me axioms two and three. And being the ring of integers, it's integrally closed inside its field of fractions. And that covers for me axiom four. But another example, just to show you that bigger things exist, is that in general, if I took A to be perfectoid, then I can form some version of a polynomial algebra over it in which I add, well, it doesn't need to be plus or minus. Well, I've already, well, let me get rid of the plus or minus because it's only confusing. So I add all p power roots of some variable, and the angle brackets means that I suitably periodically complete it. And so this then gives us lots of examples. If I, let's say, so in fact, maybe one other comment, but also if you take something perfectoid and you look at some, maybe some finite tau algebra over it, then this will also be perfectoid. And so if I start with some random algebraic variety or some scheme over O, I look at some bits of it, they look at tau over some polynomial algebras, I extract all p power roots of all variables, I periodically complete things, and in this way I can produce lots and lots and lots of perfectoid rings that control what's happening to my original algebraic variety that I want to study. Yes? Did you mean to say that you take, you take A, invert P, take a finite control over that, and take the integral, P integral closure? I didn't mean to say that. Uh, okay, so I promise, so as I, so let me perfectoid, so this ring of integers inside CP, this is perfectoid, and just for the sake of concreteness, we're going to focus on this case. All the statements I'm going to make actually hold for any perfectoid ring, but it's maybe nice to have this particular example in mind. And so I promised that this was going to satisfy, from the point of view of topological Hox homology, a similar property to FP. And indeed, that's a theorem 
goes back to calculations of Hesselhalt, that indeed the topological Hochschild homology of this perfectoid ring O just looks as I claimed. It's vanishing in odd degree, in even degrees that are all one-dimensional, and multiplication is as nice as possible. So in the idea to prove this, you know, it's of a very algebraic nature. I'm trying to understand THH of O. So on the one hand, I can map this down, let's say, to the Hochschild homology. I'll tell you what we're going to do. Um, let's... I told you yesterday that the difference between the topological theory and the classical theory only differed by some, some kernels and some co-kernels, which would be killed by some bounded integers. So in particular, if I invert P in the topological theory, what it will spit out for me will be the classical Hochschild homology of O over ZP with P inverted. And this is something that you can understand just using some classical methods. By classical, I mean somehow non-topological. On the other hand, you can kill all P power roots of P. And when I do that to O, I get the residue field of O, which is FP bar. And that's something that you can analyze thanks to Birkstead. He tells us exactly what the topological Hochschild homology groups of this perfect field of characteristic PR. So in this way, you get some information both about the behavior of these groups after inverting P and by going mod P. And if you balance these off one another in the right way, you can indeed calculate what's in the middle. And let's see Time's doing. So let me write down, or not bother writing down. I'll tell you what, let me not bother writing down. So like this morning, one then gets some, some formal consequences. So this morning, we saw that if I took any FP algebra, then in some sense, its topological Hochschild homology was built by assembling various copies of the Hochschild homology according to certain shifts. We'll get exactly the same result here with the same proof. We saw also that in the particular case of a smooth algebra over FP, this would let me explicitly describe all of the topological Hochschild homology groups just as being direct sums of various copies of differential forms. Again, the same will be true here. If I take a smooth algebra over O, or if I take a smooth al algebra, in fact, over any perfectoid ring, then you'll be able to describe its topological Hochschild homology groups as some explicit direct sums of copies of differential forms of this smooth algebra. Let me move instead onto the really interesting question at hand. What does the topological periodic cyclic homology of something like a perfectoid ring look like? See, we saw this morning, and it was crucial for what I said a moment ago about crystalline cohomology, that if you plug FP into this theory, in particular, if you just take the zero TP group, then it converts FP into ZP. It's quite remarkable. It lifts up FP to the level of ZP. And so what if we plug in now our perfectoid ring O? What can it output? Well, that's what I'm going to tell you. But first, we need a little aside on periodic Hodge theory. So we've got this perfectoid ring O, this, this ring of integers inside CP, and we can associate to that what's called these days its tilt, O flat. So this O tilt is by definition obtained by perfectifying, that's an honest perfectifying, not perfectoidifying or anything strange, O mod P. But it's unfortunately perfect, perfectifying it in a different way than we've been doing previously. So there's two ways you can perfectify a ring, either as an initial object or as a final object. 
And so here I want to look at the, well, it's a limit. It's a limit. So it solves whichever one that's got to be. It's, previously I was looking at a co-limit. Now this is going to be the limit over all iterations of the Frobenius map on O mod PO. So explicitly, that means I look at all P power compatible sequences inside my ring. All sequences X0, X1, and so on, where the XIs live in O mod P, and XI to the P is equal to XI minus 1. Now, let's recall that in O, P has lots and lots of P power roots. So this ring, O mod P, it contains lots and lots of nilpotent data, and in particular, there's lots and lots of choices of P power roots of any given element. So I look at all possible compatible choices of P power roots, and that forms for me, that forms for me a ring. And that ring is the tilt. It's, so it's a manifestly an, an FP algebra, uh, and indeed it is, and by definition, it's a, it's a perfect FP algebra. And let's have an example of an element inside it which will play a role. So I can look, for example, at the sequence P, P to the 1 over P, P to the 1 over P squared. Or really, I mean these elements mod P. Well, that is in particular a compatible choice of P power roots. And so it gives me an element inside this ring O tilt, which is usually denoted P tilt. So now that we've got some perfect FP algebra, what do we do to it? Well, we do our favorite thing. We lift it up to mixed characteristic by looking at its ring of witnesses. W of O tilt. And this, oh, let me rearrange that on the page. So I put an arrow going down instead, maybe. So I take its ring of width vectors, W of O tilt. And since O tilt was a perfect ring of characteristic P, this is something that behaves relatively nicely. Well, maybe you're most familiar with rings of width vectors in the case in which you plug in a perfect field of characteristic P and then output something really nice that outputs a complete discrete valuation ring. That's not going to happen here because I'm inputting a pretty big perfect ring, so it'll output some pretty big non Noetherian ring. But if I take it mod P, then it nevertheless recovers for me O tilt. So it really is some lifting of O tilt uh, up to the mixed characteristic world. And this ring of rid vectors is what's denoted by A sub inf. It was introduced by Fontaine and goes by the name something like Fontaine's, I don't know how much this terminology is really used, Fontaine's infinitesimal or Fontaine's first period ring. So in the early days of Piatic Hodge theory, Fontaine constructed all these extremely complicated period rings. These Duran period ring, crystalline period ring, semi-stable period ring, they go on to various modifications. But the, the, the starting point from which you build all of these is this A inf, this ring of width vectors of O tilt. And as I say, by formalism of width vectors, when I take it mod P, I recover O tilt. But here's the really great thing. If I take it modulo P minus so I have this element that I wrote down a moment ago, P tilt inside O tilt. I can take its Teichmuller lift to the ring of width vectors. And if I kill P minus Teichmuller of P tilt, Fontaine proves that it recovers from the original ring that I started with O. So this thing, this A inf, is simultaneously lifting both the characteristic P world and the mixed characteristic world that we started with. 
And this element, just to, to follow the notation that one finds in the literature, this element P minus Teichmuller of P tilt is normally denoted. That's a psi. I, I swear. I swear. It's hard with these thick pens. <laughs> oh, but now life is going to get even worse. Now life is going to get even worse as far as notation goes. Because I've got to draw for you a spectral sequence which already looked pretty bad this morning. And now it's going to be even worse because the terms in this spectral sequence are either going to be zeros or O's. <laughs> I wonder if I should change color. Uh, I do have multiple colors. Here's the pink one. Which one? So what do you want to be pink? Yeah, this might be a good idea. I think I prefer. I'm not, okay, okay. <laughs> Otherwise. Okay, so what we're going to do now, that's some of the end of our side on some topics from Piatic Hodge's theory was the introduction of this, this ring A in, which plays a fundamental role. And now I want to continue to analyze this topological periodic cyclic homology of O. So I'm going to look at the same spectral sequence that we had this morning for FP, but now in the case of O, because we've computed that the THH groups behave the same way, so we get a spectral sequence that behaves the same way, namely, okay, here goes. I have an O, I have another O, I have another O. Let me, let me draw a little bit more so to orientate myself. I have a zero, zero, zero. I have an O. U, I have an O, U, I have an O, U. I once read a paper which had uh, maybe three different types of valuation rings, and they were all denoted by different font O's. Um, it, was, it, was, yeah, it was very hard to make notes on this paper because I couldn't reproduce them all. That's a zero, that's a zero, and that's an O, U squared. And they were continuing that way. Here I would have another O U squared. Things are continuing like this. As I say, it's the same as I drew so badly this morning. And I guess I should make these dots pink because they represent zeros. I think I did a better job. And this is converging. It's zero and everywhere else. And this is converging to the TP groups of O. And so once again, there's somehow two possibilities. Again, there's no, there's no room for differentials, so it's telling me in particular that TP0 of O, whatever this ring is, is built by adding up. I think it was even green this morning, wasn't it? Is built by adding up everything lying on this anti-diagonal through the origin. And somehow, at least I only have enough imagination to think of two possibilities. I mean, either some other filtration is splitting, and you'd imagine that we get, in that case, O power series U, or, well, now we have another example of a ring which is built out of copies of O, because you mod out by this non-zero divisor psi, and you get O, and so therefore all, also all of the psi A's mod, excuse me, psi A mod psi squared, all the psi squares mod psi cubes, these all look like copies of O inside this ring. So another ring that would have compatible properties with the filtration that the spectral sequence is giving us is this ring A inf coming from Piatic Hodge theory. And indeed, somehow I would not be giving this talk if it were not the case that it's the second one of these that shows up. And to compute that, well, there's a couple of ways you could approach this. You could either proceed like this morning, and argue that some of the behavior of the spectral sequence, the extension problems that you see in very low degree, are largely controlled by what's going on also in low degree in Hochschild homology. There you can pick some explicit complexes representing what's going on and do a calculation. Or you can, in fact, reduce it to what one already knows about TP0 of FP. You know that already there, the extension problems behave nicely, and that you get ZP rather than FPU. Um, so as soon as you can get some, some, some map between two of the objects, you can then try to go mod P and reduce it to information that you already have. And fortunately, Fontaine proved that his ring has a universal property. It's the it's initial among P-complete, P-torsion-free 
rings which can be written as inverse limits of nilpotent thickenings of O. And one sees that indeed TP0 of O has this property because it's built out of, I mean, if I chop this off at any stage, that will compute for me uh, some, some, some homotopy group of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a negative cyclic homology, in fact. No, it'll be the homotopy co-invariance instead. Okay, forget that. If I chop this off at any stage, then it will correspond to some nilpotent thickening of O. So we see in that way that TP0 does have this sort of property, and that will then produce for me from this universal, as I say, from this initial property, which, which Fontaine proved, that I have a map from A and into here. And then if I want to check that, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, that's, sorry, that's supposed to be what this statement says. Uh, it's this one. I should. Ah, you see, if I put a mod P here. No, it's not as simple as that. If I put a mod, then it's more complicated. But I can, I can tell you about it later, if you like. Okay, so I was just trying to say that by some, by some universal property of A inf, you can, in fact, construct a map from A inf to here. And then if you want to check that it's an isomorphism, you can... So I say you can you can you can go mod p and check some behavior as to how tp of fp behaves, and that's how you prove that in fact, in fact what what tp does is it takes in this perfectoid ring O and it outputs its a inf ring coming from Piatic Hodge theory, and so then we ob obtain a consequence like this morning. Namely, that for any O algebra A, so maybe this is, for example, some smooth O algebra that we're studying, which forms part of some smooth O scheme uh, whose piatic Hodge theory we want to understand. This is, a, this is actually not a nice statement, so people can, well, I'm going to write it just the same. And if you understand that it's not a good statement, then you understand, and if you don't, even better. This looks like... If I look at the TP theory of A, and I mod it out by this P minus P tilt, then it's going to recover for me the HP theory of A over A. And we've seen in general that periodic cyclic homology is related to Durham cohomology, particularly for smooth things. And so it seems that this topological periodic cyclic homology of our O algebra is related to some some lift to this ring A inf of the Durham cohomology. of A. And understanding what was going on here was what spurred a lot of, was what spurred this work. Again, this is with Bhagav Bert and Peter Schulze that we wanted to I mean, somehow understand explicitly what this, this lift of Durham cohomology seems to be. And so the statement at the end of the day is that there does exist some cohomology theory playing this, playing this game, playing this role. So there exists, let's say, let me not make a completely precise statement, cohomology theory, let's say for smooth algebras. So I take some smooth O algebra R, and it's going to output some complex of A inf modules, which in the new notation is denoted by prism of R over O, or if you're very classical, which means that you use the notation from one year ago, <laughs> is denoted by A, oh, that's not really, a, that's not a definition, is denoted by A omega 
of R, this is now for old-fashioned people, um, with the following nice properties. So firstly, it does resolve the sort of problem that we've posed a moment ago, namely, it lifts Durham cohomology. in the sense, so with some complex of A inf modules, I can look at it then mod psi, and up to equivalence, this will give for me the Duram complex of my smooth O algebra R. So it is indeed lifting the Duram cohomology. And then secondly, It is what shows up in topological periodic cyclic homology. So TP of my smooth algebra, I have an analogous statement to what we had a little bit earlier for crystalline cohomology, has a filtration with graded pieces given by it, rather given as usual by all shifts of it in order to make things too periodic. And I want to mention one final property, that it has some relation, which I don't want to write down in detail, to the Piadic et al. cohomology of R1 over P. So R1 over P is some, uh, I mean, it defines for us some, some smooth affine variety over CP, and the study of its piatic et cohomology is what we'd like to do in piatic hot theory. So what this gadget therefore provides for us is something that lets us simultaneously understand the piatic et cohomology and is deforming the Duram cohomology. Uh, what can I write? I don't even want to write sketch. I don't want to write. I don't even want to write ingredients. Uh, I just want to write down some things that sort of tantalize you. Uh, key keywords. Keywords that that enter into the proof and to give you some indication of where the the theory stands now. So one proceeds in the same way as we did for periodic cyclic homology on Sunday, and 45 minutes ago for the topological periodic cyclic homology of FP algebras. Namely, we can't really analyze what happens directly when we plug in a smooth algebra, but we can use the fact that on the smooth algebra, the theory is completely controlled, while well, previously it was controlled by what happened when we passed to the perfection of a ring. Now we're, in, we're no longer in characteristic P. We don't have perfections. We instead have perfectoidifications. So for example, if R were some polynomial algebra, then we would just add to this polynomial algebra all p power roots of all the variables that are appearing in order to get some nice perfectoid ring controlling a little bit the behavior of our original algebra. And then we proceed as before by constructing some check complex, namely we also look at the value of our cohomology theory. It's not going to be space. On R perfectoidified tensor over R, R perfectoidified, and so on. And so we get formally that if we can understand well enough the, the behavior of our cohomology theory, topological periodic cyclic homology, on these gadgets appearing on the right, then we'll get some information about for our smooth algebra. And so the key is then to compute just as we did this morning in the case of crystalline cohomology, TP0 of all these rings that are appearing on the right. Now, earlier, these rings that were appearing on the right were quasi-regular, semi-perfect rings. 
They were perfect rings, modular regular sequences, essentially. These were homologically simple rings that we could, that we could control. Well, now they're quasi-regular semi-perfectoid rings. That is to say, they look essentially like perfectoid rings, modular regular sequences. And this, again, makes them homologically simple and, in some sense, controllable. So earlier, when we did this construction, what was outputted was a classical crystalline period ring. And what comes out now is some sort of prismatic period ring. I'm almost there. Where this prismatic refers to the prismatic cohomology, which is currently being developed. In fact, I think it's essentially done now. Of Batten-Schultz. So this is not historically how the proof went, but I think it's better to view it like this. So the idea of this prismatic cohomology. So what did we do earlier? I mean, we had some rings that we understood, like rings of Wick vectors of perfect rings, and we added divided powers of certain elements. And the very vague idea in this story is that you replace the sorts of divided power constructions that were appearing by P derivations, or in other words, delta structures. So a P derivation is some replacement for uh, some replacement for equipping your ring with a Frobenius lift in a way that well, in a way that behaves better. And if you can sufficiently well identify then T P zero of these all these quasi regular semi perfectoids in terms of these prismatic period rings, say, then you'll get some relation between TP of your smooth thing and its so-called prismatic cohomology delta of R over O. And the prismatic cohomology is constructed exactly to be a deformation of the Duram cohomology. Which proves the first property. And then to prove this, well, okay. I mean, historically, uh, I've adopted a strange point of view here. I mean, the, when, we, when, we, when we initially proved this theorem, we didn't have prismatic cohomology. That's been developed since by Barton Schultzer. And from that point of view, it's very easy to understand the Duran comparison theorem. It's somehow, it's the, really the, the key property of their theory that you have connections between prismatic cohomology and Duran cohomology. At the time, we had an alternative definition of what we were expecting to filter TP. And this, as I say, this old-fashioned definition comes rather as a, some sort of construction from Galois cohomology of big period rings. And there, it's very intimately related to a tau cohomology. And from that point of view, it's easy to read off this relation to periodic tau cohomology. You know what? I think I should finish there and just say that I hope you've enjoyed this roller coaster. Uh, in which lots of interesting objects have appeared. Thank you very much. Questions? So I have a question about the characteristic P story. Suppose I start with a smooth algebra of dimensions strictly less than P over yeah. P. Is your filtration on TP of A canonically split then? Oh, I'm asking because the analogous statement for HP seems to be true by HKR. Is the filtration on TP in the by dimension? That sounds P. very reasonable. That sounds very reasonable. Okay, uh, other questions? So, um, this question might be part of just my ignorance of the literature, but I'm sort of wondering, um, has the, have this new integral comparison theorem has been, been used or in the process of being applied to 
arithmetic situations where we previously wanted some nice integral p to Hodge theory, maybe like in advancements in modularity lifting or something like that? No, for the moment, it's not been, it's not been heavily used in that context. It's not been heavily used in that context. I mean, for example, one would ideally like to use these sorts of results to better understand torsion appearing in the Piatica tau cohomology of Schmur varieties, for example. And that's not yet been, been seriously exploited. Further questions? OK, uh, let's thank. Oh, there is one. OK. Go long. <laughs> Are there any duality pairings? Uh, yeah, if you take, uh, let's say, if you, if you replace this smooth O algebra by some proper smooth scheme over O, then indeed the cohomology theory will satisfy Proncret duality in the, in the nicest way you can imagine. So we have like the sheaf of invariant differentials sitting inside of Durham cohomology. Can we somehow see um, from this what the deformations of that should be? Sorry, what, what's your input? Um, the, if you have like the sheaf of invariant differentials of like an abelian variety or a petavisual group or something, it sits inside of the Durham cohomology. And you can, if you deform the Durham cohomology to some crystalline setting, then you get a deformation on the other side. I'm wondering if it can be seen in this framework. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, uh, let's thank Matthew for this very nice lecture series. <laughs>